burned every hut, every structure, so people would have nothing to go back to. They made refugees out of everybody who lived in this entire area. And I wrote a report about it and sent it back to my government, saying here are these radical genocidal killers. And nobody in the US government believed me. They didn't think I, that I had it right. Shortly thereafter, uh, that single engine plane landed, gave me an envelope, and said I was assigned to Washington, D.C. on the NSC staff. I was back there in 74. And then in March and April of 1975, as Vietnam began to collapse, I was on a plane going to Saigon with a presidential fact-finding mission. And while there, I went out and here's a city of several million people, most of whom wanted to be refugees. They wanted to flee, desperate, trying, and I listened to them. And I was at the embassy, and, and there wasn't anything being done. There were no real steps being taken to prepare to evacuate people, people to whom we had a great obligation, who had sided with us in the war, and who would be at great risk uh, on that. And, and so I went and got a few of my friends together. We pulled our own little organization. We started alerting people. We had a safe house. And then when I got back to Washington, I waited till about 9 o'clock at night when there wasn't anybody else around. And I went over to see the National Security Advisor, Brent Scowcroft. And I said, General Scowcroft, it's not much happening in the embassy, but there's a group of us. We have people who can be saved if you'll just give the authorization for planes to start going to Saigon and to bring people out. And he went to the president, got the permission, started that, and eventually we started taking 20 and 30,000 people a day out of Vietnam. Now I got to the last day and I came to work in the morning and I found out that the National Security Council, the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense had all met with the President and they had stopped the refugee evacuation. So it's about April 27th. And I was able to get on the phone and call Saigon and I talked to my friends who were there and they said, there's 20,000 people at the airport. There's no military attack. The planes can land. They're waiting. We can save these people. So what do you do? You're still a young member of the staff. I can't run in to see the president um, uh, on this. So I ran across the street into the White House and found the White House photographer. It was a young guy named David Kennerly. And he had been a war photographer. He had seen the suffering face to face, up close. He and I had traveled together. I said, David, David. There's 20,000 people waiting at the airport in Saigon. It's still clear. But the president and the NSC, they've turned off the evacuation. So President Ford thought of David Kennerly like his son. So Kennerly runs up into the Oval Office. And, you know, he was a journalist. The president thought he's got great sources. And the president turned the evacuation back on. And the plane's flying in again. And I used to get Christmas cards from people whose families got out on the last day. Now, eventually there was maybe 130,000 people who got out of Indochina who came to the United States and that was it. Now this is where sort of my relationship with Governor Ray begins as I was loaned by the State Department to Iowa. And here's the great stories about Governor Ray who deserves to be a legendary figure in our state. Republican governor, popularly elected, and Governor Ray was uh, interested and followed the Vietnam War. And as the refugees came out of Vietnam and were processed and arrived in the U.S., there was one group of them called the Thai Dam. Ethnic, separate ethnic people from northern Laos, 
who had been, had their own language, their own culture, their own traditions, and they were about to be scattered all over America. Because refugees were, nobody, you couldn't pick, we all want to go to California, we all want to go to Florida, no. Every state has to have their share, and you just get assigned. And they were about to be scattered, their culture dissipated. And they wrote to every governor in America saying, please, please, won't you take us as a people? Only one governor responded, Bob Ray of Iowa. He read the letter. He said, maybe we can help. He went to Washington. He lobbied the president and the secretary of state, and he got permission for the Thai Dom to come to Iowa and be kept together as a people. And they're still here today, doing well. A few years later, 1979, the boat people started escaping from Vietnam. They would get on small, frail boats, meant really to be on rivers or canals, and at night go down the rivers and out into the South China Sea and navigating as best they could by the sun and the stars, try to find their way to Malaysia or Thailand or Indonesia or the Philippines or wherever you could make it. Some would run out of gas, some would run out of water, some would be attacked by marauding pirates, killed, women raped, robbed. And then those who were fortunate enough to make it to shore had the terrible fate of being pushed back out to sea by local officials who didn't want to be overwhelmed with refugees that no country in the world would take. America was taking no refugees. All of the countries of resettlement, traditional resettlement, nobody was taking any more refugees from Indochina. And Ed Bradley of CBS went and captured the scene on film for CBS reports. Of, and here, on a cold January night, we watched in horror in the governor's office to see this show of this boat filled with Vietnamese boat people being pushed back out and starting to break up in the heavy waves and people falling into the sea and drowning before your eyes, some washing up on shore. It was transfixing. Now, no one in the world expected the governor of Iowa to do anything about international refugee issues. And I remember it's 10 o'clock at night. There's only a couple of us in the office with the governor. And he said the question that you always have to ask yourself. He said, we have two choices. We can do nothing. We can turn our back. No one will be critical of us. Or we can try somehow, try to reach out a hand to help, to save a life. And he wrote a letter that night to President Carter, and he said, if you, Mr. President, will just reopen America's doors, Iowa will double the number of refugees we've resettled. So you can imagine it wasn't necessarily the most popular thing to say politically then or at any time. So here, the first governing official anywhere in the world to step forward and say, we will take the boat people refugees, was the governor of this state. And he went to Washington, and he addressed a room full of all of America's governors, and he implored them, join with me. I don't know what we were thinking. We thought that maybe they all would stand up and say, yes, let's do it. And there was this terrible silence. Nobody put up their hand. Nobody volunteered. And finally, one Republican and one Democratic governor said, we'll be with you, Governor Ray. They went to the White House. They went to the president and urged them to change their policy. And six months later, in Geneva at UNHCR headquarters, they had the International Conference on the Boat People, and Walter Mondale, the Vice President of the United States, stood up and said, America is reopening its doors, we'll take 168,000 refugees a year, 
And people, almost all the delegations, stood up and cheered for America. And as Walter Mondale walked back to his seat, Governor Bob Ray, who was there, as I was there, ran up to the vice president and said, this is the proudest moment of my life as an American. And it's a great proud moment for all of us. But it should be a especially proud moment if you're from Iowa that it was our governor who did this. A few months later, Pope John Paul II visited. Great humanitarian message. And a month later, we, Governor Ray and I, were in Thailand at the Cambodian border when we saw 30,000 Cambodian refugees who had stumbled out of the Khmer Rouge rule. Imagine it's like the entire student body of the University of Iowa, strewn about an open field, dying at the rate of 50 to 100 a day, their bodies being pushed with bulldozers into mass graves. And the governor came back with pictures and descriptions of that that sent an electric current around the state. And we formed Iowa Shares, which stood for Iowa Sends Help to Aid Refugees and End Starvation and Rush Doctors and Nurses and Food and Medicine from this state to the border and into Cambodia to help sustain life. But perhaps the most iconic moment of all of my experiences with the governor came in a place called Nong Kai in Thailand, which was a camp for Thai Dam refugees waiting and hoping to be resettled, hoping America might take them. And we came to the gate of the camp and they had a big sign saying, welcome Iowa Governor Ray. And we we're being escorted in and being treated very nicely. And the refugee leader said, Governor, we want to show you our symbol of hope. So we thought, what could this be? These are an ethnic people. Maybe there's some sort of a carving, some sort of a spiritual uh, symbol. And they took us into this thatched hut. And up on the wall, they had tacked the Iowa Department of Transportation highway map <laughs> with the pins stuck in it where all of the other Thai Dam were settled. And they said, this is our symbol of hope. So I'm so proud to think that our state would be that kind of symbol to people located 12,000 or more miles away, never been here, probably never heard of Iowa much before, but the legacy that we have. And people say, well, what is it about Iowa that would have such a, give it such a foundation? I said, well, we have a very rich history, a wonderful humanitarian legacy. Not too many people know about it. About 20 miles or so from here is West Branch, Herbert Hoover's Presidential Museum. You know, most people think of Herbert Hoover as a failed president who somehow is responsible for the Depression. But Herbert Hoover is, in my estimation, the single greatest humanitarian in the history of the United States of America while working for a Democrat. While working for Woodrow Wilson, he took food from America, not money to buy food, because there wasn't any food in Europe. He took food from America to Europe to feed eight or 900 million people at the end of World War I. We have Henry A. Wallace, vice president, the man who took American agricultural know-how beyond our borders. Jesse Field Shambaugh, the woman school teacher from Clorinda who started 4-H. Maybe our most significant refugee to ever come here was George Washington Carver. Emancipated from slavery at the end of the Civil War, turned away from school in nearby states. He ends up in Winterset, 
doing laundry, the kind of job that probably many refugees would find themselves doing. A sponsor family befriends him, provides him an educational opportunity at Simpson College, and he goes to Iowa State, never had a black student, and probably could have turned him away. But to its everlasting credit, emulated the great legacy of this university and admitted George Washington Carver. And he became a scientist, went to Tuskegee, and one of the great American agricultural scientists of the first half of the 20th century. And, and the man to whom Mahatma Gandhi turned in 1929 as he began the struggle to free India of colonial rule and fearful that he wouldn't be strong enough for this long, difficult journey, asked George Washington Carver for advice about his diet, which Carver gave. Isn't it terrific that in a small, but perhaps not insignificant way, that an Iowan had this kind of role in India becoming independent and free. And of course, the founder of the World Food Prize, Norman Borlaug, farm boy from Howard County, only mistake in life was going to the University of Minnesota. <laughs> I say that at Minnesota too, so they, and, but who developed miracle wheat, took it to India and Pakistan as they faced imminent mass starvation credited with saving a billion lives, of whom it is said saved more lives than any other person who's ever lived in all human history. And whose statue will next year be placed in the US Capitol as one of Iowa's and America's and the world's greatest heroes. That's the legacy we have in this state. I want to finish by just telling you a story about my son's wedding, which we held in Des Moines at the World Food Prize Hall of Laureates in honor of Dr. Borlaug. I told you my wife's from Vietnam. Her family were refugees twice. They all live with us, two bedroom, one bath house, 14 people in Northern Virginia. So they were all there for my son's wedding. He was marrying a young woman from Thailand, Chinese. And I got up to give a toast and I said, you know, I hadn't thought of this before, but actually all, everyone here is from an immigrant family. His wife's family were economic refugees from China during terrible times, went to Thailand. My wife's family were refugees. Even you go back far enough, my Irish ancestors left as refugees to come to America. Governor Ray was there, so wonderful that he came. And my wife's brother-in-law was also there. He was one of those boat people refugees who Governor Ray saved. And I brought him over, his name was Twin. I brought him over to meet Governor Ray. And he reached down and shook Governor Ray's hands and he said, thank you, you saved my life. That's the story of so many refugee efforts. Refugees would say, thank you. You saved my life. You gave me this new opportunity. I'm so proud to be from a state that has that kind of legacy. And I'm so pleased you're having this conference here. It's so appropriate to have it here, given that history of our state. Thank you for having me here. I'm happy to, and I'll answer the tough questions on that. So. Thank you so much, Ambassador Quinn, for such a moving presentation. If you have questions, please fill them out on the cards uh, and pass them to the aisles. And I'm sure uh, Ambassador Quinn would be happy to answer tough or, tough or easy questions. Right. To
So the question is, uh, what is the U.S. doing and what should the U.S. and Iowa be doing in regard to Iraqi and Afghan refugees? Hmm. Well, you know, I'm, I'm out of the refugee uh, business now, and I have to admit I'm not up on policy. Um, you know, when the State Department in the mid-70s the entire refugee office was one person. Now it's an entire bureau, and appropriately so. Um, I, I would think, it, with, and I don't know, this is just off the top of my head, but there have to be a lot of people in Iraq and is it Afghanistan to whom we have some obligation, and who, if they remain there, who have, who have done things, put themselves in danger, uh, to whom we should be open uh, to helping them and assisting them if it's the case that they really can't stay, that they really would be in danger. You know, you always want to be careful that you're not taking all of the people that a country needs to make its way in the future uh, from there and, and bringing them here. But so it's always a balancing act to be done. But I, I'm, I apologize that I I'm not trying to duck the hard question. I just don't know the answer, and I don't know enough about the policy. I, I work on food security issues now. But it's, uh, so I hope that there are advocates uh, for that. Anybody here from the State Department? Uh, but, uh, should I? One more, actually, from a uh, Loris graduate, class of 67. Oh, wow. Uh, Alan Greenspan found that there was never a famine in a country with free speech. Comment, please. Wow, wow. Uh, well, I think, you know, I think India, everything I know, had free speech in the, in the 60s, and they were, they were facing that. Uh, I'd like to, to think that my own experience of going around and looking at countries and seeing how they appear to be doing and what their prospects are for the future. And my sense is number one, and this not necessarily in exact order, but number one, countries are only going to be successful to the extent that they make use of all of their human resources. And that particularly providing education for young women for through middle school, high school, college, and into the sciences and encouraging them. Those are the countries that are going to make it in the next 40 or 50 years. Uh, and that. that secondly, I think the free speech part of some sort of political structure in which there is the ability to say and do things and produce economic progress is, is true and clear that if you are, don't respond to dictatorial manners uh, and policies, if you're not able to bring some pressure against them. Now, some would say, well, look at China. China is not a democracy. It's not a... Uh, a country where the government is chosen through uh, votes. And China has made stunning and dramatic progress. And it has achieved the UN development goals of reducing poverty and hunger by 50% way already. But I was in China in 1979. And I've seen what it was like then, when there were no tall buildings, when there was no economic development, when everyone wore green suits and black suits. So there is a lot more freedom now. May not be political freedom, but it's economic freedom. And if you watch carefully, Xi Jinping must have learned something.